This is going to be a timeline of the book of Revelation and end times events. I'm not a perfect person and I'm not God, so I don't claim to know the exact time of when everything happens. I'm not saying you have to agree with everything I'm saying. I'm just giving you the outline of when I believe the Bible shows that all of this takes place. I don't believe the book of Revelation is in chronological order, but actually gives four accounts of the second coming. The four Gospels give four accounts of Jesus at his first coming, so it shouldn't be a stretch for you to believe the book of Revelation gives four accounts of his second coming. Before we begin, I'm going to show you the four accounts of Jesus Christ's second coming that are laid out in the book of Revelation. If the book of Revelation is in chronological order, then why does it have, it, why does it have Jesus Christ coming back four different times? If you look at these verses in Revelation chapter 6, 14 through 17, you see the first account of his second coming. Let's look at it. It says, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now let's look at the second account in Revelation eleven fifteen through 17. It says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God saying, we give, th we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Notice it said, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So that sounds like the second coming has, has just happened. And the kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms of, of our Lord and of his Christ. Yet this is in Revelation 11, 15 through 17. So how could this be, how could Revelation be in chronological order? And now look at the third account of the second coming. In Revelation 14, 19 through 20. It says, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered, gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horses' bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Notice it mentions the winepress just like the fourth account does in Revelation nineteen eleven through 15. It says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp two-edged sword, or out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So you have four accounts of the second coming in the book of Revelation. And with this in mind, we are going to start with the book of Revelation and end times timeline. First we have the translation of the body of Christ that happens before the time of Jacob's trouble even starts. I have multiple studies showing why I stayed believing in a so-called pre-tribulation rapture that ha happens before the time of Jacob's trouble and why that I stayed believing in that instead of getting on any pre-wrath rapture bandwagon. 
But the scripture for this translation of the body of Christ is found in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57. All born-again believers, dead or alive, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and will receive a glorified body. Sometime after this event, the time of Jacob's trouble will begin. And now I'm going to give you the outline of when I believe all of these events take place. And if you don't agree with this timeline, then that's fine. You can make a study and show how that I'm wrong. Because I'm definitely not right on everything I believe. And if you think you're right on everything you believe, then you would be God. If I was right on everything, then I would be God. But with all that said, let's look at year one of the time of Jacob's trouble. I believe the 144,000 are sealed in the first year of the time of Jacob's trouble. Look at Revelation 7, 1 through 4. It says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Notice it says, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. When the seals are opened in Revelation 6, the sea and earth do get hurt. So this sealing of the 144,000 must happen before the seals. So I believe this would prove it happens at the very beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble. So year one so far we have the sealing of the 144,000. And not, not only this, but the man of sin, which is the Antichrist, will sign a covenant with Israel. And Daniel 9.27 it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall he shall be poured upon the desolate. Since he breaks the covenant in the midst of the week, this shows that he makes the covenant at the very beginning of the seven year time period. And now we are going to see how the first seal happens in the first year. In Revelation 6, verse 1, it says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. The one riding this white horse isn't Jesus Christ. It would be his counterfeit which is the Antichrist. Notice it says he has a bow, but yet it doesn't mention any arrows, and that is because he comes in peaceably. And in Daniel 11.21 it says, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. The second seal seems to take place in the first year as well, if you look at Revelation 6, 3 and 4, it says, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. The Antichrist does come in peaceably and seems to rescue the world from economic collapse, religious confusion, social destruction. But since the Antichrist is taking over, there has to be war. But yet he will still come out looking like a good guy and a man of peace. But he will have to knock off a, a few people to take over completely. So in the first year I have the ceiling of the 144,000 
the signing of the covenant with Israel, and the first and second seals. Now, if you look at the second year, we have the third seal. Revelation 6, 5 says, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The black horse represents worldwide famine. During this time period, wicked rich men will have all the food, and poor people will suffer and be dying of starvation. So around this time, there is famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places, people claiming to be Christ and deceiving the masses. And you can read about that in Matthew 24, 4 through 8. And in Matthew 24, 8, it says, All these are the beginning of sorrows. He said, People claiming to be Christ, deceiving many, wars and rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes, and that that is just the beginning of sorrows. And now let's look at the three and a half year mark in the time of Jacob's trouble. It seems sometime around the three and a half year mark that you have the arrival of the two witnesses, which are Moses and Elijah. And we know that their ministry lasts three and a half years. And it would obviously be Moses and Elijah, but we can't get into that right now because it would take too long. And by reading the chapter, it looks like their ministry does last three and a half years, and that three and a half years being at the end instead of the first. So you can see their arrival is sometime around the three and a half year mark. In Revelation 11, 3, it says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. So they go out preaching, and fire proceeds out of their mouth that devours their enemies. Also around this three and a half year mark into the time of Jacob's trouble, you have the assassination of the Antichrist. Revelation 13 and verse 3 says, And I saw one of his heads as that were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. So it says, power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Forty and two months comes out to be three and a half years. So it seems he is assassinated right in the middle of this future time period since it says he's going to continue three and a half more years. He's already ruling three and a half years. He's assassinated and then he continues three and a half more years. And not only that, but you also have war in heaven that takes place around the midpoint of the time of Jacob's trouble. It says in Revelation 12, 7 through 9, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and the angels were cast out with him. When Satan is cast into the earth, he enters the man of sin, which is the Antichrist. At this point, the man of sin becomes the son of perdition. In Second Thessalonians 2, 7, it says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The mystery of iniquity is already at work because there are many antichrists leading up to the Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist is already working. 
and they are forerunners paving the way for the Antichrist, knowingly or unknowingly. The he in verse 7 is referring to the men of sin, hindering Satan from completely taking over until he is taken out of the way. He is taken out of the way when the Antichrist dies in the three and a half year mark into the time of Jacob's trouble. He then resurrects to counterfeit the resurrection of Jesus and then Satan comes into the man of sin and he becomes the son of perdition. So that he who is letting would be the man of sin and he prevents Satan from coming into the son of perdition until he is taken out of the way. And then in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 12, it says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. At this time the Antichrist will stand in the holy place, claiming to be God. In Second Thessalonians 2 4, it says, Who it opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Matthew twenty four fifteen. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So he desecrates the temple, and this is another proof that the body of Christ is gone before this takes place, and before the time of Jacob's trouble, because during the church age, God has his people for a temple. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, God goes back to dealing with the Jews, and God again has his, or has a temple for his people. So, in the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. In the church age, God has his people for a temple, and in when we get into the time of Jacob, Jacob's trouble, he goes back to having a temple for his people. At this time, the Antichrist also breaks the covenant with Israel. And so, at the midpoint, you have the arrival of Moses and Elijah, the Antichrist assassinated, war in heaven, Satan cast into the earth, and Satan entering into the man of sin, making him become the son of perdition. And then you have the breaking of the covenant and temple desecration. And now let's look at the three and a half to fifth year of the time of Jacob's trouble. And this is where I believe the Antichrist causes all to take his mark. If you read Revelation 13, it definitely seems like the mark comes after the Antichrist is assassinated. Revelation 13, 16 through 18 says, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. So this seems to happen after the midpoint of the time of Jacob's trouble. But the mark could have been around before, but not mandatory, like it says it is here. Notice it says, and he causeth all. So he's making everyone get it. I mean, it could have been there before, but not mandatory until this point. But around this time, the world church is destroyed as well. In Revelation seventeen sixteen it says, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. 
the religious whore, the Roman Catholic Church, is destroyed so that Satan can get worship directly. It will be a one-world religion of worship to the Antichrist, who is Satan incarnate at this point. Also, around this time, you have Israel fleeing into the mountains, like it says in Matthew twenty-four sixteen. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. It says, pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So it looks like someone is keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a sign between God and Israel and has nothing to do with the church. And this is just more proof the body of Christ isn't going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Remember, it's the time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. It's not actually called the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is just a description of this time period with the actual name of this time period being the time of Jacob's trouble. And in Revelation 12, 6 through 17, it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand, two hundred, and threescore days. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times and half a time from the face of the serpent and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood and the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ so you can see how the earth is going to open up and help the woman and it's kind of reminds you how in the Old Testament that Korah and all that pertained unto him was swallowed up by the earth so seems like the same thing is going to happen here and so they are keeping the commandments of God along with the Sabbath as we saw before and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Also during the three and a half year to fifth year mark, we have the fourth seal. In Revelation 6, 7 through 8, through 8, it says, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sit on him was death and hell, followed with him. And power was given unto him, unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Notice it said his name that sit on him was death and hell followed with him. The Jews made a covenant with the Antichrist and when they did this made a covenant with death and hell. The Antichrist breaks this covenant in the middle of the time of Jacob's trouble and this is what Isaiah 28:15 might be referring to. It says, Because ye have said, We have made a covenant with death and with hell, are we at agreement? When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. So the pale horse comes through and kills a fourth part of the earth, and kills them with sword, meaning more war, and hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. The animals will see men as prey, and won't fear man during this time. Also during this time you have the martyrs under the altar, which is the fifth seal in Revelation 6, 9-10. It says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, 
I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? These people were martyred for Jesus Christ in a religious satanic worship service, probably similar to what the Catholic Church does now, where they believe they are literally drinking Jesus' blood and literally eating his flesh. And this is just conditioning for what's to come when God's people are killed and eaten during a religious worship service in the time of Jacob's trouble. Micah 3.3 3 says, Who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them, and they break their bones and chop them in pieces, as for the pot and as flesh, within the cauldron and I believe the martyrs are here in this part of the timeline because this is around the time when the mark becomes mandatory and they are martyred for being faithful to Jesus Christ and not taking the mark the first second third and fourth trumpets also seem to happen around the time of the fifth seal and since the things that happen during these trumpets represent the same kind of powers that Moses and Elijah had in the Old Testament, it could be that God uses them during these trumpets. Take a look at Revelation 8 and verse 7. It says, The first angel sounded, and there followed hell and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burned up, and all green grass was burned up, and the second angel sounded, and, it, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed, and the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the river, rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And remember, since God goes back to dealing with Jews, the believing Jews during this time period will be able to drink the water without it bothering them. Just like Mark 16 Seven through, 17 through 18 talks about them being able to drink any deadly thing. And then Revelation 8:12 says, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And since... It is getting darker. It shows the judgment of God is intensifying. And you're probably wondering why I just placed the trumpets here. And I have a reason for that. And the reason is in chapter 8 and verse 3. And it says, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. It talks about prayers of the saints ascending up before God. I believe that is the same saints as in the fifth seal that were martyred for their faith. They were martyred for not taking the mark. They were beheaded just like ISIS is beheading people now. Remember they were praying in Revelation 16, it says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And now we will look at the fifth trumpet. It seems to be sometime within the last three years of the time of Jacob's trouble. During the fifth trumpet, devilish locusts are released out of the bottomless pit. In Revelation 9, 5, it says, And unto them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. 
So these locusts torment for five months. And if you look at Revelation 9.15, you see the four angels that are loosed out of the great river Euphrates. And they are prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year to slay the third part of men. So if you add that and the five months together, then that is about one and a half years. So the fifth and sixth trumpet would have to happen somewhere at least before the five and a half year mark. Also, I believe this is right before a rapture of the 144,000 because Revelation 9-4 lets us know they are still around. In Revelation 9-4 it says, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing nor any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. It would seem that they are raptured sometime within the last three years, probably towards the end somewhere. It's like we don't know when the rapture for the church will be, so I don't know when this rapture for the 144,000 will be exactly either. But you can see there is a rapture of the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 14. It says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And then we see the vials in Revelation 16. And this seems to take place towards the very end of the time of Jacob's trouble. We can see the people are getting sores from taking the mark. And the mark became mandatory after the resurrection of the Antichrist. So we know it is definitely in the second half of the time of Jacob's trouble. Then you see the sixth vial which is poured out dries up the river Euphrates. We know that the four angels were loosed out of the river Euphrates previously in the sixth trumpet. So this has to take place after the sixth trumpet. So I'd put the vials happening towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. The sixth angel dries up the river Euphrates so that the armies can gather themselves together easier for the battle against the Lord Jesus Christ. So, one, the first vial, one, a noise, noisome and grievous sore comes on those who have the mark. Number two, the sea becomes as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul dies in the sea. Number three, rivers and fountains of waters become blood. Four, men are scorched with fire from the sun. Five, darkness goes over the Antichrist's kingdom. And six, the river Euphrates is dried up. All these happen somewhere probably within a few months of the second advent. And then a few days before the second advent, you have the death of Moses and Elijah in Revelation 11, 7 through 9. We know this happens right at the end because if you go down to verse 15, it is saying the second advent is taking place. And so now we will look at the day of the second advent. You have the rapture of Moses and Elijah after the spirit of life goes into them. It says in Revelation 11, 11 through 12, And after three days and a half the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. There seems to be another rapture the day of the second advent as well where you have God's elect caught up. In Matthew twenty-four, twenty-nine through 31 
It says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. It seems that when Jesus comes back at the second coming, he catches up his elect to go to battle with him. So this puts us at three raptures that are yet to come. If you want to call it a rapture, the Bible calls it like translated, like Enoch was translated. So a good Bible word would be translation. The first one was the body of Christ that's going to leave out before the time of Jacob's trouble. The second one being the 144,000. And then you have this one here in Matthew 24. And in Revelation 14, 14 through 16, it says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap. For the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So you have a rapture of the body of Christ, 144,000, and then the remaining at the very end at the day of the second advent. And those aren't exact dates. I'm not saying I know when these things are going to take place. I'm just saying what I think the Bible implies. At the day of the second advent, you also have the sixth seal. Notice how well the sixth seal matches Matthew twenty four nineteen. It says in Revelation six twelve through seventeen, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and though there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and every island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And the seventh vial also happens. Notice he says in verse 17, It is done. Revelation sixteen seventeen, And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And then you also have the seventh seal. In Revelation 8, 1, it says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. It is likely that the silence in heaven is because Jesus Christ and the saints are down on earth fighting. Look at Zechariah 2, 10 through 13, which talks about silence at the second coming. It says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord, and many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee. 
and the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. At this time, Jesus comes back and kills all the God-haters, and this is where you have Revelation 19, 11 through 16. It says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he shall smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. At this time you have the beast and the false prophet cast into the lake of fire. And Revelation 19.20 you also have the seventh trumpet at this time. Notice it says the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. Revelation eleven fifteen, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hell. Then sometime shortly after this point, the judgment of the nations takes place in Matthew twenty-five, thirty-one through 46 God will renovate the earth because of all the catastrophes. Not the new heaven and new earth yet, but it has to be fixed up after what just happened during the time of Jacob's trouble. You can read about this in Isaiah 35, 1 through 2, and Amos 9, 13. You also have Satan cast into the bottomless pit sometime before the millennium. In the millennium, you have Jesus Christ reigning for a thousand years, and then Satan will be loose out of his prison and this is where you have the battle of Gog and Magog in Revelation 27 through 8 it says and when the thousand years are expired Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea and this battle doesn't last long because Revelation 20 and verse 9 says, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. After this, Satan is cast into the lake of fire, and then God judges the wicked at the great white throne judgment, along with saints from the Old Testament, saints from the time of Jacob's trouble, and the millennium. This judgment is spoke of in Revelation 20, 11 through 15. And then New Jerusalem will descend to the earth, as it says in Revelation 21. And then you have the new heaven and the new earth talked about in Revelation 21, 22. And this has been the revelation and end times timeline. I don't expect you to believe everything I said in this. I'm not God, so I'm not perfect. I'm definitely not the final authority. The King James Bible is the final authority. If anything I've said goes against the Bible, then I'm a liar in that case. I never intentionally went against the Bible, but if I did, then I was wrong. Since we don't live in the time of Jacob's trouble, we don't know when and how everything is going to work out, and we don't know the future. So to give an exact time for each event and be 
100% correct would be impossible. I just gave you, to the best of my ability, what I thought the Bible taught about how the events took place. And I hope you enjoyed it and that it will help you in studying the book of Revelation.